The University of Wisconsin Oshkosh Fox Cities campus assists the city of Menasha with video recordings of city meetings. Menasha residents and interested parties can get information about city meetings, meeting agendas, and other documents from the city website, www.cityofmenasha-wi.gov. To express opinions about City of Menasha issues or these broadcasts, contact the mayor's office, 920-967-3608. Contact a city alderman. Contact information appears on the website. Or complete the electronic feedback form on the city website. All public portions of the meetings are recorded in entirety and are not edited. Good evening, I'd like to call the City of Menasha Common Council meeting to order. Please rise and join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. If we could have the roll, please. Alderman Taylor. Here. Alderman Sevenick. Here. Alderman Langdon. Here. Alderman Schmidt. Here. Alderman Tom Grady. Here. Alderman Ted Grady. Here. Alderman Rapella. Here. All are present with the absence of Alderman Nichols. So the first item on the agenda this evening is a report of department head staff and consultants. And we do have Nick from Gold Cross Ambulance here this evening to share with us a little bit about their um, ambulance service within the city of Menasha. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I appreciate you guys having me out today. I'd prefer to be at the podium, but I guess my clicker's got range here. So I'll be, I'll be over here to make sure that I can uh, progress to the slides. But I think it's been about two years, two and a half years since I've been here, so I do appreciate you guys getting me back in and being able to kind of share what's changed, what's stayed the same, and uh, give you a little bit of an overview of what the service we provide the city of Menasha. Um, so start, our, our, our focus has always been on patient care. So we've been um, in the Fox Cities and the city of Menasha since the early 90s, and we've really uh, grown and progressed and uh, modified how we do business over the last five years to really be focused on the region that we provide care to. Um, we, we still continue to have joint ownership from both Theta Care and Ascension, 50% uh, ownership by on both. We have eight board members that will meet on a quarterly basis. Uh, they have oversight of really our finance and our quality. There are two big buckets they look at our organization is how we're doing as an organization, what's the quality of care that we're providing. So they'll look at response times, and then obviously the patient care that we provide on an uh, annual and monthly and quarterly basis as well. Uh, again, with the regional system, we have 14 ambulance on every single day, um, and that covers about 1,200 square miles. But the important thing to understand about our system that's maybe a little bit different than uh, the fire departments or services that you're familiar with is um, we'll move ambulances all around our region. So you'll see um, as we get busier, ambulance calls come in, we're moving those 14 ambulances around our service area to um, be more efficient with what we have and uh, be, be really strategic where, where we have ambulances placed. So you know, if we have a call in Menasha and the Menasha ambulance goes out, we're constantly backfilling and getting another ambulance into the, the city to handle the call volume that you guys have. Um, so about four years ago, we transitioned to the majority of our ambulances going to 12-hour shifts. We used to be on a 24-hour shift model where the paramedics were at the station 24 hours a day. Um, and obviously, we had to factor in some downtime. We, went, we were in a, couldn't be as strategic and um, efficient with those resources because we were tr constantly trying to get them back to their home station. When we transitioned to 12s, we got a lot more operational flexibility out of our ambulances because they didn't need to get that rest time. They were only on for 12-hour shifts. They got to go home and sleep in their own beds and really allowed us to move those ambulances a lot more uh, deliberately and effectively around our 1,200 square miles. Um, so that allowed us to get more really bang out of the buck for the resources that we had on during the day. And it also allowed us to track and trend areas within our response zone that we needed to be a little bit more strategic. So on a quarterly basis, I'll meet with our, our dispatch center, we'll review response times, and then we'll modify those posting guidelines based on gaps we have in our coverage area. So we do a lot with our ambulances that is a little bit more unique, and um, you know, it really allows us to, to cover 
the city of Menasha as well as the surrounding municipalities the best we can with the current resources we have on it at any given time. Um, just a, a couple things I wanted to go through. This is this is similar stuff we go through with the mayor on a uh, annual basis, but these are kind of just common questions we get. You know, how often the ambulances actually get canceled? So we arrive on scene and the patient elects not to go to the hospital or they just need help or evaluation at the home. So we do that um, quite a bit throughout the year um, in the city of Menasha. The most common uh, uh, time we do that, so it's about 374 times a year. So 374 out of the roughly, um, we do about 1,500 calls in the city of Menasha on an annual basis. So about 370 times uh, the patients are electing not to go to the hospital. Most of the time it's an evaluation. They just wanted to get checked out. They don't feel like they want to go to the hospital. And the other major factor is what we call an invalid assist or help up. So somebody has fallen, they don't have the family or friends around to help them get off the ground. We help them into their chair, get them what they need, and then uh, we have them sign off. So those are the most common, uh, two most common that we'll see when it comes to no transports. The next is kind of what are we coming to in the, the city of Menasha? So what is the most common thing we're seeing, we're encountering uh, when somebody picks up the phone and calls 911 in the city of Menasha? Uh, number one, and this is, this is very similar across the board when you look from municipality to municipality, sick persons and falls are the two biggest ones that we're going to see uh, and continue to see year to year. Only about 3% um, is a cardiac arrest, so something that we would consider a true emergency, one that we need all hands on deck. We work really closely with Nina and Ashton Fire Department and their first responder groups to help us on those types of calls. They're very well trained and a very well educated department that really makes our job a lot easier when we respond to those critical calls. So it's, it's a small volume that we respond to the really critical calls, but again, really important to have our education and training partnerships we have uh, with the city here. Patient destination, this should really be no surprise to anybody that lives in the city. Um, we basically, about 65% of the time, we're either going to Theta Care Nina or we're going to St. E's because you guys are really right in the middle of those two hospitals. And we see that from municipality to municipality. People are going to what they're close to. So if they know that Alpha Medical Center is their closest hospital, they're typically going there. Um, insurance is a, is a factor there, what coverage they have, uh, but really, it's only a small amount of individuals that have uh, private insurance, only about 17%, 16.5% in the city of Menasha that have private insurance. So there is some flexibility with what hospital destination they can go to. And then obviously AMC and then other hospitals is a factor there as well. Uh, Paramix, so majority Medicare, about 55%, 54.9% of your um, Paramix within the, the city. So the ones that actually call 911 are Medicare patients. Uh, and then Medicaid makes up 24.5, and then private insurance about 16.6%. So this, we look at this frequently to determine, you know, the, the demographic that we're encountering here, that is an older population that we're seeing more and more in our business. Um, and then this allows us to help um, budgeting and uh, allocation of resources as well on an annual basis for our region. Response times, so this is the month to month breakdown. Um, so we have an average response time uh, on the annual year of six minutes and six seconds. And then our goal um, is 89.34% or our goal is 90%. We were just shy of that this year. Um, a couple factors that really attributed to uh, our response time issues in 2021, which we saw that really across the board, we were uh, either just above or right below our response time goal of 90% was the interfacility transport call volume we were seeing with the hospitals. Uh, their demand and the need to move patients from one hospital to another was up about 40% in the last quarter of 2020, uh, 2021 and 20% for the previous three quarters. So that transfer call volume fell on us and we had to get creative with deployment of resources, but we did a really good job of making sure that we were taking care of both, both aspects of our system. So moving the patients and residents around uh, the service area um, that we have to get them the care that they needed because you know hospital admissions were at an all-time high and bed availability was really at a, uh, at a premium that, uh, last year. So we had to get really creative with that part of our business and to ensure we were still able to provide really quality 911 care in the city of Menasha, which we were still able to do. Uh, just a few things that I wanted to highlight. Um, the equipment that we have in all of our ambulances is really top of the line, uh, something that we're really proud of. We've invested really heavily into our organization through 
uh, capital expenses and everything that uh, we bring in the door, we invest back in the organizations. We continue to provide quality care. So whether that's ambulances, medical equipment to provide the best care possible, um, we have power cotton power load systems, which helps not only Gold Cross and our workman's compensation mod when we're looking at lifting and twisting and putting heavier patients in the ambulances. It helps the fire department as well because they're often helping us lift and load and get those patients into the ambulance as well. So that was a big expense that we saw really pay out well for us in our experience mod for workman's compensation. Uh, video laryngoscopes, when we're on that, that 30 calls, those cardiac arrests, we're able to visualize the airway, get that advanced airway in place and continue our life-saving measures a lot more efficiently. So a lot of pulses in all of our ambulances, and then uh, we have pediatric specialty care bags. So one of the things I wanted to focus a little bit with the council on tonight that I haven't done in previous um, uh, presentations for you guys is really the quality. So response times are great. How fast we can get to the call is fantastic. But if we don't have the right people getting the call and provide the right quality care to the residents, we're not doing our job. We can get there as fast as we can, but if we're not knowing what we're doing and we're not really working well and collaboratively with our first responder groups, uh, we're really not pr providing that whole 360 degree patient care that we'd like to provide. So the first slide here is what we call uh, acute coronary syndrome or STEMI patients. Um, so STEMI patients are your true heart attack, so ones that we actually will physically diagnose in the field. So our paramedics will apply the cardiac monitor, they'll identify abnormalities within that EKG, and then we'll activate the hospital system to get their cardiologists in place, their nurses, um, their techs into the hospital so that when we hit that door, they can go right up for intervention as quickly as possible. So we look at the number of activations, which uh, was pretty consistent year to year. We're up a little bit this year already. Um, we're up uh, about 36% uh, uh, this year already from 2022. Um, so we'll see if that continues to sustain, but uh, very consistent numbers there. And then our door to balloon time. So that's from the time we hit the door to the time they actually have intervention in place and fix the problem within the heart. The national standard is 90 minutes, and in 2021, we're at 69.3. So well below that national standard, providing that good care, identifying what we need to identify, and getting them to the hospital for intervention. Strokes is something that we've seen a, a huge increase on over the last really four to five years uh, is the number of stroke victims. I think that's, it's a few things. We're identifying them much sooner and quicker by getting having good response times. Um, the, the fire departments and first responders are really well trained on this now as well. So we're identifying them earlier on. And then our goal, because um, there's not a ton we can do pre-hospital-wise for these patients. They need to get to the hospital, they need to get clot-busting drugs, or they need to get into a, a surgery suite for intervention. So our goal really is 15 minutes for this pa these types of patients, and we were at 16.11 last year. So something we're working on, we're striving towards um, and seeing time and working with our, our first responder partners to help us with that, um, to reduce that scene time and getting them to uh, definitive intervention at the hospital quicker. So this, this chart's actually going in the opposite direction. It's going in a really good direction. So having the local trauma center right in your backyard, we work, Dr. Georgian's on our board right now, and one of the, the, the thumping pieces he has at every single board meeting is how is our trauma scene times? Again, not much we can do for traumas in the field, but they need to get to that hospital. They need to get it there as fast as they can when we have a true trauma victim. They're internally bleeding. They have multiple orthopedic injuries that need to be repaired. Not them, something we can do in the back of the ambulance. So the faster we can get them off that scene in our ambulance on the way to the hospital, the better the outcomes are. So we saw that number go down in 2017 from 20 minutes and 13 seconds, and we're all the way down to 10 minutes and 9 seconds in 2022. So really doing a really great job with that. Um, and even though we've seen more volume, our volume's gone qu up quite a bit. And typically when you see more volume and have more of that work, you're going to become more proficient. So we've seen that kind of uh, mirror itself as well. And the last one that we, we really look at as far as quality-wise is cardiac arrest. Um, so we've seen that, that number go up. And when you talk about a cardiac arrest, is really um, we talk about the um, chain of survival. So early activation of the 911 system, getting high quality CPR in that patient as quickly as possible. So we're working with our first responder groups to get there first, apply that AED, do some CPR on that individual prior to our arrival. We take over, provide the paramedic level care, and happily, hopefully have good outcomes at the hospital. National benchmark for that um, is 10%. We saw that dip down a little bit 
in 2021 uh, to 12%, but we're back up to 18% um, in 2022. Uh, we have also been benchmarking against um, the American Heart Association's registry, so that's a national benchmark, so it looks at uh, ambulance providers across the nation as well as locally, and we're well above the national standard when it comes to cardiac arrest survival rates, so something we're really proud of and something we continue to work on on a daily basis. And then critical care numbers. Um, so actually the critical care team has been moved to our headquarters right up in Menasha. So we actually have a uh, critical care paramedic and a critical care RN now that is working out of the headquarters that responds into the city of Menasha on 911 calls. Very highly trained, very highly educated. Um, basically the, the, the best care you can possibly provide in this industry is right out of Menasha now. So it's really cool that we've been able to move them down there. They're on 12 hour shifts now. Um, so they're handling the, the inner facility transports that are out of the ICU, so they're really critically ill individuals, but they're also handling the 911 work in Menasha as well. So something cool and unique that's changed in the city that I wanted to share with you guys. With that, I'll take questions and thank you guys again for having me. Alderman Langdon. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you for coming tonight. It's always a pleasure. I have a, a couple, few questions. Sure. Um, I was writing them down as you we were you were giving us presentation. The first um, a question I have is, what kind of twelve hour shifts uh, uh, do your EMTs work? Yes. What we do is we really look at um, our call volume is a bell curve. So we kind of start getting busy right at ten o'clock. We'll peak around four o'clock with our call volume. We'll sustain that around till eight and nine o'clock at night, and then we dip down at night. So. Really after 2 a.m., there's not a high call volume within our service area. So we have uh, ambulances that are tw have 24-hour coverage that start at 5, 5.30, 6, and 7. And then we also have 12-hour ambulances that we staff during peak hours. So we have one that starts at uh, 9 a.m., 10 a.m., and then 2 p.m., and then we cover those peak hours. So we'll, we'll ramp up our ambulances to add more ambulance when the demand is higher, and then we'll trickle it back down when the demand is lower. Okay, cool. Thank you. Um, do the M EMTs keep the same shifts? Yep, EMTs, paramedics work in the same shift together. Yep. They don't like um, they don't move around from, or should not, I'm sorry. Um, do the do they keep the same area, or or do they move around? Yep, good question. All of our full time staff have a, a a station that they're dedicated towards. We used to plop them around from station to station. Um, because the volume is so much different in the Fox Valley compared to our Wapaka County station, just to get them more experience, what we found is they struggle a lot with navigation. So when they go, 1,200 square miles is a lot to memorize, but when you have them only in the city of Menasha and covering some of the surrounding smaller townships and villages, they could become much more proficient with navigation, knowing the service area, and so we found a lot of value in that. So we went to permanent stations two years ago. Yeah, yep. working all great, I bet. It is, yeah, it is. Really for is. the EMTs, yep. yeah, cool. Um, so uh, this kind do you, well, I, I guess there's never a dumb question, but, um, I, uh, got to use you guys a couple of few times, um, but I never thought of this until you just brought it up, the insurance. Mm -hmm. So say, um, you know, you're at my house and, uh, mm -hmm. how do you know where to take me? Um, it's, we have a, a patient destination algorithm that's part of our protocols. 95% uh, of the time it's patient preference. So tell us where you want to go, we're going to take you there. Um, about 10% of the time it's based off of um, the type of situation you're encountering. If you're in a traumatic event, we want to take you to the local level 2 trauma center because those okay. are where the experts are. If you're having a heart attack, we want to take you to St. E's or AMC because those are where the experts are. Uh, but the majority of the time, it's it's uh, patient destination is based on their preference. Okay. Mm -hmm. And um, last one, cardiac arrest and heart attack. Mm -hmm. is it, there must be a difference between the two? Yep. So uh, a cardiac arrest is your heart stop. It's no longer working, right? we got to try to get it restarted. Um, where a STEMI or a cor acute coronary syndrome is there's something happening within the vessels of the heart, usually an occlusion of some sort um, that is uh, causing that chest pain um, because it's not getting the proper oxygen it needs to function. That's what's causing that chest pain. Um, and that actually will show up on the EKG and we'll see that. And we can see actually what wall of the heart 
is effective and where they need to go in and make the, the put the stent in right from that EKG in the field. And heart attack? Same, heart attack and the STEMI are kind of the same thing. It's just more of a medical term versus a layperson term. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, the reason I ask that, um, uh, for me, uh, heavily, big time, um, about five years ago, so far nobody, and, and it will be interesting to hear mm -hmm. what your answer is, so, so nobody in the medical field that I have mentioned this to has never seen it that high, mm. and uh, my potassium level went up to 9.7. Sure. So every muscle in my body froze up but my heart. Mm. My heart, wow. fortunately, you know, I wear a couple chains, you know, mm -hmm. was strong enough. Mm -hmm. But they, everybody said that, that um, you know, at about a seven, seven level, you usually, you, you go into cardiac arrest. Mm -hmm. So why cardiac arrest and not a heart attack? Mm -hmm. um, do they say um, it's it's multifactorial and, and okay. you know everybody's different you know lab values are variable some people have really bad outcomes at certain levels my mother-in-law just had a sodium level that the doctor said he's never seen in his entire career and she was fine and alert and talking so um, every person's a little bit different um, you should probably be thanking your lucky stars you're you're sitting there tonight absolutely because that seems, uh, really, absolutely really I thank the Lord sure. in the morning and thank yeah. him for a great day when I go to bed right Thank you so much. You bet. Alderman Rotella. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I just want to thank you guys for doing such a great job. I think your service and your presentation was outstanding tonight. So keep up the great work, and we're glad that you're in Menasha. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Alderman Taylor. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I, too, uh, uh, want to thank you guys for locating in Menasha mm -hmm. and providing such great service to the area. I live in your downtown area. Uh, I'll hear a call. I'll hear the Station 35 unit go out, mm -hmm. and you guys are always, you know, a few minutes behind them because of a time shift mm -hmm. where the stations are located. But it uh, always seems like you guys uh, are all at about the same same time level and everything. So we certainly appreciate appreciate the response time uh, in the city and the level of service you do provide for for our citizens. And also, you made comments about how well you work together with the fire department we with do. our first responders mm -hmm. and. Uh, probably even our police department at times yep, if it's a, uh, um, I forget, you guys get different classifications on the calls. If yep. it's a medical emergency, then it's everybody. Yep. So, yep. Yep. Uh, so again, thank you for the high level of service you provide to our community. You bet. Okay, seeing no one else, thanks for coming tonight, Nick. It's always nice to see you guys. And next year I have to remember to invite the health department to our little discussion I forgot because no Nancy normally put them together and I didn't include Chris, Christine so remind yeah. me next year if we don't do that. Yeah happy to come and uh, the mayor's got my contact information so if you guys have any follow-up questions or would like to come see our place in Nashville feel free to reach out. Okay thank you. Thank you for your donation for the Holiday Lighting Committee. <laughs> that was awesome. You thank bet. you. you bet. Yes uh, definitely. You bet. I was reminded by Alderman Garotti so <laughs> thank you. There we go. That's awesome. Thank you. Oh, I, I don't think Nick is planning on staying for the whole meeting. But you're more than welcome if you want to. <laughs> Item two is the minutes and communications. Do we have a motion? Alderman Sevenick. Thank you, Mayor. At this time, I'd like for us to receive minutes A through H and communications I through O. There's a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? Yes. Is there a discussion, Stan? Go ahead. Yes. Um, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the chief for his annual report. It was uh, very well done, and I'm sure uh, he had a lot of help with it. <laughs> but uh, it uh, reaffirms my feeling about our community, how safe we are. Um, if you look at the stats, it just you, we're lucky. The other night, a lady referred Menasha to being like Mayberry, and I agree. As far as uh, a, a nice, quaint, quiet, safe community to live in, and I uh, appreciate the work that your department's been doing to facilitate that. Um, I did have one other. I will leave it at that. Alderman Taylor. Thank you, Mayor. 
uh, Chief, uh, it takes an outstanding department and leadership to do what you guys have done and excellent policing. And um, certainly the numbers show that uh, when you look at the, the U.S. Uh, uh, crime rate and Wisconsin crime rate, uh, we're, we're a third of the U.S. Uh, crime rate and half of what the state of Wisconsin is. And and in property crimes, it's a, it's about the about the same again. So uh, certainly, um, uh, it is a safe community. I have a Airbnb in town, and I always tell my guests that uh, we have a very safe community. And uh, a lot of them are coming from major cities, and uh, they always like to hear that. Uh, I had a question or an observation, I guess, here on the. Uh, on the school system, and uh, I would have thought if somebody said to me, "What level of what lo level of education uh, uh, where would we have the most calls to?" I would have probably thought the high school or junior high school, and uh, it's elementary schools, mm -hmm. and uh, I was very surprised by that. In fact, it's uh, almost two to one for the high school, so it's uh, that certainly. Uh, the statistic stood out to me, and uh, on your index uh, uh, rep uh, report, uh, I noticed that uh, on traffic uh, ticketing and, and things, uh, the last two years was down. Uh, was that in relationship to the the COVID situation that was going on? There you know which mic you had back there, Tim, sorry. No worries. Uh, yes and no. <laughs> uh, yes, obviously there was a period of time in 2020 that we had a hi hiatus of most self-initiated activities in the early days of COVID because we really weren't sure the transmissibility of it at that point. However, along that time, too, we, we've also kind of changed our, our philosophy in traffic enforcement as well. Um, as we all know, you, 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 and you folks know what it is too, we could sit out in the 1200 block of Plank Road and write speeding tickets all day long if we so chose. So instead, we're taking a two prone approach. One is um, trying to identify the areas or the hot spots where we have more crashes and trying to direct our traffic efforts in those areas. As well as uh, we also have a thing on our traffic program where we're really trying to respond to the areas where citizens have concerns on. So that's where we're ending up spending a fair amount of our enforcement time which don't necessarily generate traffic stops, um, but it's monitoring the area. So we can report back to that person saying, yep, we sat in the area of Tico and Ninth, and we spent, you know, whatever, 300 minutes out there and saw three violations, which resulted in one citation and two warnings or something along that lines. So we're really kind of changing the philosophy. And, and one of the ways that that kind of seems to be holding to work right now is despite the fact that we had less traffic stops and less arrests or citations that were issued, uh, the crash numbers stayed the same after COVID, which we knew that the year of COVID that people weren't driving as much, obviously, and the crash numbers went down. Where crash numbers were very similar last year, being kind of out of COVID. So we're still kind of monitoring it and fine tuning it. So yes and no. Uh, certainly it's changed a little bit from COVID, but again, Making numbers to make numbers just doesn't seem to make sense. We want to do it where there's actually problems or issues by crashes or citizen complaints or issues. Of course, this year the council uh, approved uh, traffic cameras at Racine and Third and uh, Appleton Road and Third. And uh, when do you think those will be activated? Yeah, the, those are ones that we are continuing to work on. Um, Having infrastructure in the in the ground, we're finding would be the absolute best way to go it, to, to go about it. Uh, we're finding that the way that we thought was going to be the best, we've brought in two other consultants and in speaking with them, they're suggesting that might not be the best way to go. So we're really just trying to take a slow, cautious approach to this because we don't want to invest that kind of money and do the wrong thing and build a system off of something won't, that won't be scalable for the future. So it's certainly something that uh, our staff and, and uh, Public Works is working on diligently. I mean, we're having meetings, it seems like, every other week to try to solve what the best way to do it would be. So our goal would be, hopefully by the end of summer, I would say that they'd be up. Okay. 
Uh, I tell the story when I first got on the council in the early 90s, uh, Chief Stakey, we used to talk about at that time people running a late yellow light. And uh, now I think we all, uh, if we take a yellow light, uh, you look in your mirror and you think, that guy's never going to make that one. And sure as heck, they, they're almost running south. They are running south of red lights now. And uh, it seems to be uh, more and more. But uh, the one I keep hearing about more, more often lately is uh, completely uh, disregarding stop signs almost to where before people might slow down and kind of power break through them. And now it's 10, 15 miles an hour that they're just rolling through them. And uh, it seems to be kind of a new trend in the last uh, year and a half or so. And maybe through COVID, uh, uh, people got more anxious or something. But uh, uh, my neighbor has a Four Seasons porch and uh, he gives me the, the weekly report on, uh, on uh, uh, stop sign violations. So uh, public, Members of the public do, do monitor it, and certainly I, I've seen this this last uh, a year and a half more and more often. So, But uh, excellent report, and it all comes down to great policing, great leadership, and thank you for that. Oh, thank you, Mayor. I, too, want to echo Alderman Taylor and Alderman Sevenix on the police report data. Uh, Chief, that was one of the finest <laughs> reports I've seen in probably 20 some years of my business. And so you set the bar. So I really appreciate what, what you did there and your staff. Thank you. No problem. I, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't throw her name out at some point here from the comments that are being made, but our new community liaison, Shelby Burkholz is the one who did 99% of the work. I mean, everyone had the stuff that they added to the report, but she was the chef that baked this whole thing up and, and presented it. So. Yeah, very impressed. She, she certainly has taken it to another level this year, so we appreciate her work on it. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, before we go any further, we should thank our uh, special guests this evening for helping <laughs> us today, filling in. I looked over. It didn't look like our city attorney. So, <laughs> <laughs> so thanks again for uh, coming in. We really appreciate it. The guy's retired, and he still comes in and helps the city of Menasha, and, Thank you. and he, he's not even from Menasha, so <laughs> we appreciate that. Um, the other item I had, and I guess my question might be for Tom, um, in the uh, communications on, in Landmarks, I'm starting to get a little concern about um, painting buildings, especially brickwork, and um, I noticed that in your minutes, uh, they just mentioned that they wanted to paint their building. Is it not the brick part, but the, just the block part on, on the side or what? Thank, Thank you, Mayor. It's the block side that runs through the walkway, okay. which is already painted. Yep. And it's all popped and peeling. It didn't really indicate that in the minutes. Yeah. And I know that there's another building being proposed downtown to be painted. And I just don't like us painting brick. Okay. So, all right. Okay. Thanks, Tom. Yep. Alderman Taylor. I, too, echo that. Uh, uh, there's another building that's going to paint down here. And I don't mind if they paint that the fourth story that they're adding to it. But <clears throat> we certainly see what LLCs do to the city at times. And... Uh, by painting a building today and 20 years from now or 10 years from now, uh, we all know that uh, when you paint that nice brick, it's going to peel. And um, it's certainly, uh, there's a building in the, uh, behind the Faith Technology building back there that is peeling all the time because somebody painted it. And um, I, 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 I don't think that should be part of the, any restoration project or facade improvement grants because uh, uh, the nature of that and the nature of the LLCs at this time. And uh, just like to mention to the attorney, if you want to come out of retirement like uh, um, Tom Brady, we have a retirement in uh, May. So think about it. <laughs> Thank you. Seeing no one else, all those in favor? Aye. Are there any opposed? The motion carries. Item F is public comments and any matter of concern to the city. Is there anyone who wishes, Brian, if you'd like to? 
All right, is this on? It is. Thank you all. Uh, my name is Brian Caberline. I am currently a Judicial Court Commissioner in Winnebago County. What that means is I do judicial intake for the judges. They gave me power to decide things for them. So this is going on my eighth year now where I do all the uh, folks that get arrested overnight in Winnebago County, juveniles that get run away or taken away. I do mental health hearings. I uh, think we were hearing about folks that have to be transported by ambulance to the hospitals sometimes, whether it's Winnebago Mental Health uh, or any of the old local uh, hospitals. I also do juvenile intake citations for most of the county outside of the folks that have municipal courts and uh, probate. I am uh, born and raised in Menasha. I live in Nina currently. I work in Oshkosh. Uh, outside of what I do in the courtroom, I'm also chairman of the Winnebago County Safe Streets Committee, which is the committee that oversees all diversion programs in Winnebago County, everything from drug courts down to uh, local police officers working with at-risk youth. So my committee, or the committee that I serve on and that I'm chairman of, oversees the funding, making sure that they're operating efficiently, appropriately. Uh, I am appointed by the Supreme Court to the Judicial Conduct Advisory Committee. That means I'm the one commissioner that works with seven other judges to give both formal and informal ethics opinions to uh, Wisconsin judges. So if they do have questions about things they can or can't do, they can submit those to our committee. Uh, I'm a Rotarian. I've been doing that seven years. I am uh, on the Highway Commission, which again, studies the fatalities that we have on the highways in the, every quarter. I'm on the uh, Oshkosh Truancy Task Force. I feel like I'm forgetting one. Oh, conflict resolution as well. So I've been keeping myself busy. I'm very, very involved in the community. Uh, again, lifelong resident outside of going to school. My wife's uh, currently school social worker at Nina, but she started her career in Menasha. Uh, so we're very invested. And uh, I'm running for circuit court judge, branch three, it's Judge Key. Judge Key is retiring and choosing not to run again, so the election will be April 5th. And I just wanted to take a moment to introduce myself. Uh, thank you all for the time. Thank you for coming tonight, Brian. If you want to leave those out on the desk out in the lobby, people can grab those on their way out if they're Absolutely. interested. And, and Brian's also obligated to have to stay. He'll be here a long time. <laughs> I appreciate it. You all have a great night, okay? Is there, is there anyone else who wishes to speak this evening? Hi, Sandra DeVille Taylor, 545 Broad Street. I'm not running for office, but I've been tempted. Um, due to not having public, uh, public comment on administration personnel or public works, I'm going to move things around. Under administration, there's the resolution to close TIF 9 and distribute the excess increment to the overlying taxing entities. I'm all for it. I'm very glad it was not designated toward the Strong Neighborhoods Program. Under personnel, um, there is a notation regarding the pending retirement of our current attorney. Um, with that, I would like to remind the council this is a council appointment. And for years, this has been a hybrid position of attorney slash HR. I would like to see that separated again you're going to have a very hard time trying to find someone to fill both roles. We really didn't find one the last time around. Um, and we do have someone who does HR currently in, a, in another role. I would also like to reemphasize, and I've talked about it for years, while you are interviewing candidates, that you do not eliminate the possibility of a legal firm a firm that specializes in municipal law that can cover annexations and mitigation and everything and everything and has expertise in whatever you need. We do it for IT, we do it for the, the current attorney has the consultant she works with. So it's not uncalled for. Our neighboring communities of Fox Crossing, Harrison, Waverly, all rely on outside firms and as you know, we are now landlocked due to that, so they know what they're doing. And I would suggest not only um, the service that they provide, but it could also be cost saving in the end. So I strongly recommend that. Then on to public works, I have more questions than answers <laughs> regarding there's two proposals here they have no name on. I'm assuming they're coming from the mayor. Uh, for honorary street name designation policy and they're very similar 
And the other one is neighborhood street sign policy. The difference, from what I understand, the honorary street name would be a person's name, a small sign above the existing street sign. My problem in reading this is number one, it cannot be designated to anyone prior to 10 years prior than today. I made a quick little list of people it would eliminate. Smith, Reed, Gilbert, Bonta, Sonsenbrenner, Bergstrom, Whiting, Strange. We have two Medal of Honor recipients, Elmer Burke, Kenner Stump. None of those people would qualify for this. So I'm questioning why that 10 year buffer is in there. The other, we have two of these in place already that were designated for sports. One baseball, one football. That was not, I, I think that might have gone through the council at the time, but we didn't have a policy in place. Um, so I'm questioning why this is coming about now. Also, this one, the, the designee or the people who are designating it have to have three references. It has to be paid by them and go to the mayor, public works, and the council approval. The other one is a neighborhood street sign, which sounds much larger, not just the little thing on the top. Oh, also, the prior one, the ironic part is Doty Island already has these signs. And they're not white and blue. And they didn't go through the council. So I'm wondering if this is to clear that up. Because it already says that they're grandfathered in. Right. Right. See, I think the mayor had something to do with this. <laughs> the other one is a neighborhood sign that sounds much larger. There, the first 10 are going to be paid by the city. And there, um, anything installed now is already grandfathered in. You have no say. I look back. OK, let, let me just tell you a little story. <laughs> Maybe I get this from my brother-in-law. Way back, I don't know if any of you remember when 441 was first constructed, the new highway from Menasha to the north side of Appleton, a beautiful drive. You could drive that. There wasn't a billboard anywhere. To this day, there's no billboards. And that was very controversial. It came about because if you take Nina to Fond du Lac, every five feet, there's a billboard. Menasha is overdone with signage. We're just adding to it. These are nice feel goods, but I don't know if they're really necessary, especially the neighborhood ones, especially when they're encompassing large swaths of property where many of the people are not part of these neighborhoods. In fact, one of these neighborhoods is actually meeting Thursday to discuss their sign before you, you guys even contemplate it. So I'm just wondering if this is, there's something more to this than what's being said. And there's no cost estimate for the neighborhood signs either. OK, then just on to the agenda really quick, because I'm sure I'm under the stopwatch. Um, I also would like to thank the Chief of Police for his report. Very well done. To me, the one thing that really stuck out, though, was that code enforcement is no longer part of the police department. It's been designated to community development. Community development does not enforce code. They, do not, they don't want to write citations. They want to be welcoming. They want to attract business and people to come here. They don't want to be the bad guy. <laughs> it's a terrible proposal. It needs to go back to, to the police department that know what the rules and regulations are and can get down on some of these signage issues that we are having and junk cars and everything else. Alderman Seven mentioned a woman the other day compared Menasha to Mayberry, which is some parts are very true, but another woman, it might have been the same one, considered it gritty. That was her definition. 
And there are places in this city that are gritty. And that's why code enforcement really needs to be part of the police department. Um, under your communications, there was supposedly a Bonta Village Lofts and Bryn construction update. It was not part of the packet, at least online. So I don't know if you got a hard copy of it, but you approved it and the public has no knowledge what the update is. Um, then we have some amendments. There's a TIF amendment to the development agreement between Nina and the Lakeshore Ridge Apartments. These are out by Lakeshore Lake Park Road. My first question is, are the neighbors aware of the change in this project? It's getting much larger than what was originally proposed. More traffic, more parking, more noise. Another problem I have with this is that the cap on the payment was removed and just simply 20%. With the cost of materials and construction and labor going up, your payout just went up a minimum of 20%. And also, if at the end of the TIF we haven't paid them, they want a lump sum payment. I mean, where are we going to come up with the money if, if it doesn't work out? I think we're looking at a problem there. Um, real quick, I'm not real familiar with the development between Atkins Group, but I have questions regarding the pond. Apparently, according to the memo from the city attorney, they're insistent on having docks on this pond, and this is a question for a director of public works. Can you have docks on a stormwater pond? To me, it seems like the stormwater pond is to, to accumulate the sediment and needs to be dredged every 10 years or so, and this they're trying to make into a lake. Um, so I'm kind of questioning with the DNR and permitting. Um, under ordinances and resolutions, really quick, there's the cancellation of outstanding checks. There is one that I'm questioning just because I believe that person is leasing property from the city, and we're going to write off $20,000 if I have this wrong. Um, someone may want to ask about that. Um, and I'm hoping, oh, there's the using the ARPA funds, 150000 to go after grants. To me, that sounds like a huge amount of money. And these are grants that we should have been working on for the last 10 years. And what have we been waiting for? And now we want to use ARPA funds to pay, to write a grant that we may be lucky if we get $50,000 out of. I don't know. And lastly, um, the mayor has an appointment. I'm hoping just like last week that that there this person was on the top of the list. Thank you. Is there anyone else this evening? Seeing no one else, we'll move on to the consent agenda. Do we have any items that you would like separated this evening? Alderman Sevener. Thank you, Mayor. I'm just going to go through all of them. So at this time, Mayor, I'll move for the Approval of the minutes of the Common Council of 3722. Second. It's a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. Are there any opposed? Seeing none, the motion carries. <coughs> Item two is a payment. Alderman Langdon. Mayor, I'll make the motion to accept the payment to MGI Building Services, contract unit number 2021-08. That's for the Public Works Facility Cold Storage in the amount of $77,717.50, final. Is there a second? Second. There's a motion and a second by Alderman Taylor. Any discussion? Seeing none, if we could have a roll call vote, please. Motion carries 7-0. Item three is a change order. Do we have a motion? Thank you, Mayor. I'll make the... Uh, 
Uh, motion to accept the change order to Northeast Asphalt Inc. Contract unit number 2021-10. That's for the street construction and rehabilitation deduct in the amount of $1,752.60. Change order number one. Is there a second? There's a motion and a second by Alderman Taylor. Any discussion? Seeing none, if we could have a roll call vote, please. Motion carries 7 0. Item 4 is a payment. Do we have a motion? Thank you, Mayor. I'll make the mo motion to accept the payment to Northeast Asphalt Inc. Contract unit number 2021 10. That's for the street reconstruction and rehabilitation in the amount of $42,853.21. And that is payment number 7. There's a motion and a second by Alderman Taylor. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, if we could have a roll call vote, please. Motion carries 7 0. Item I is action items. The first is the accounts payable and payroll for March 4th through March 17th. Alderman Grady. All right, thank you, Mayor. At this time, I make the motion for the accounts payable and payroll for the term of 3 4 20 two through three seventeen of twenty two in the amount of two million three hundred sixty two thousand eight hundred thirty nine dollars and forty two cents. Is there a second? I'll second it. There's a motion and a second by Alderman Rapella. Any discussion? Alderman Sevenek. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Ms. Taylor had a question on one of the checks. You, Jennifer, I'm sure you were paying attention and had that one. Oops. I don't think there was a question on the checks. I think it was on the write-offs. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought it was. The, oh, yes. Okay. Thank you, James. Um, I've. Uh, I'm going to make a, re a personal request. Um, I uh, think it's too much for us to do these accounts payable and payroll on our laptops here. Um, I know I had like three or four that I wanted to talk to Jennifer about. And then when I ha get a hold of her or she finally gets a hold of me, I have to turn on my computer and search. And then um, the other day, one of the aldermen asked me a question about something. And uh, so I'm going to request that I get a copy in the future. Because if I have a hard copy, I can underline those things and then I'll be better prepared for the community. Right now, it's, it's become extremely difficult um, for the past few accounts payable and payroll, we, we've been spending some odd dollars that just appear each month, and I think they're high and they're ridiculous. We're, we're doing uh, things for, uh, like, will kill, stuff like that. Um, uh, I don't get the appropriate answers when uh, we have Johnson Controls coming in and doing... Um, inspections on top of inspections for I keep being told for the sprinkler systems well you don't need to be doing that all the time I think uh, we're just being billed uh, also for fire extinguishers I mean the cost involved and and I've I did contact the, the a fire chief about this and maybe in time we, we can have our own people do these things uh, with the sprinkler system you have to be certified and they're going to be working on that but I think there's a lot of things that we just routinely pay that it's getting to the point where I think because we're government we're just paying that bill and I, I want to have I want to look at these things a little closer so that's all I have to say on that for now and I'll follow up more but in the future uh, so if you want a hard Haley, copy, I, I need a hard copy just for now. Question, you can come pick it up. Yep. Uh, you can deliver it, Mayor. <laughs> My car only leaves the driveway once a week, so <laughs> I'd have to charge you mileage. <laughs> well, I notice everyone else in the city does. So. <laughs> I do not. Seeing no further discussion, if we could have a roll call vote, please. Motion carries 7 0. So we do have one beverage operator's license that was recommended for deferral. Nice um, 
<laughs> I don't know if Ms. Mulder is, I'm guessing Ms. Mulder is not here this evening. Um, Tim, did you have any comments on this before we move forward with this? Yeah, the chief is going to speak first. Oh, I'm sorry. I keep forgetting that you have the mic. That At I some point, on, maybe. Because I can't see it from this point. <laughs> so, yes, I am. So the, uh, the person who put in for this, we have had some conversations with her, and I think this is exactly why we've recommended to change the rules to this. What is on her record is a felony, but it is from 2004. Um, as Pam would give you the... the uh, speech on and I'm sure Attorney Godlewski could do the same thing because she has the felony technically by statute that it would be a denial however you also have to look at the time frame and the applicability of the offense to bartending or working actually she would be a convenience store person but e either way is that really impactful almost 20 years later so this is one of those historically that we would have denied just for the mere fact that it had the felony and then uh, it would have been brought back to this body in, in more times than not, and rightfully so, you folks would have overturned it. So as far as our position on it goes, is uh, it is certainly one by statute that we uh, need to notify you of that felony, but we do not believe that there is an issue or a rel relevancy to the offense that she had on it that would preclude her from getting the license. Well, Ren Rapella, does that give you enough information to make a motion? Or do you uh, have yes, comments? I'll make a motion uh, the, for the beverage, aver, uh, beverage operator's license application for the 2021 to 23 licensing period. I'll make a motion to, um, to deny um, uh, Ms. Amy Mulder. Oh, let's see. No, no, no. No, uh, I'm sorry, to approve. To approve Amy Mulder. So there's a motion. Is there a second? I'll second it. There's a motion and a second by Alderman Grady for the approval of the operator's license. Discussion? Did you have anything else, Randy? No, I did not. Thank you. Alderman Sevenick? I just want to say that um, I, I'm okay with the motion, but the individual, if they felt strong enough about this license, that they would have been here this evening. They didn't appeal. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, that's pretty amazing that we're going out of our way to give her it and, and have the common sense to be here so that's interesting um, go ahead chief the only thing I can say to that is uh, Miss Mulder is going through a pretty rough time um, she's currently homeless and she really needs this job to get back up on her feet so she may not have the means to have come to the meeting tonight all right I appreciate that no problem Thank you. so I, I didn't want it to be like that she was being disrespectful to the body though um, and is it you, you had mentioned earlier too that it's potentially for maybe a convenience store or something to that effect or so yeah fifteen and fifteen I Appleton kind of look at that differently yeah too, fifteen so. fifteen Appleton Road is where she was uh, planning on going okay seeing no further discussion if we could have a roll call vote please this is to approve yes. Motion carries seven zero. Item three is the third amendment to the developer's agreement with Lakeshore Ridge Apartments. You have a motion or discussion? Alderman Sevenick. Thank you, Mayor. I have. Uh, uh, I'd ask if the gentleman could step up to the mic and ask for unanimous consent to uh, be able to question the individuals. Question. Uh, Sounds uh -oh. nefarious. Uh -oh. <laughs> what, question? What's wrong with that? It just sounds like questioning at a court rather. Well, I mean, they're the questions. only ones that are going to be able to answer my questions. Anyhow. <laughs> so, okay. Yeah, they are. They are hiding behind. I always TV appreciate you guys do come to the meetings. Yeah. But, of course, if I were in your shoes, I would be here, too. I think uh, what Ms. Taylor said about informing the public is important. Um, we had a... Uh, quite a few people here last time when your first building was built. But the thing is, is that that first building has been a kind of a pillar to the community. I think you did a great job and it's a beautiful project. 
Uh, my concern with the increase is uh, not so much about more traffic and those kind of things, but um, we're are you going to finish phase two before you do phase three? Because the the condo thing isn't even broken ground yet. So I'm concerned about that, that you, you your, your bread and butter is coming from the other end, and now you want to increase the, the number of units. And then I hear later on you guys come here and say we're not going to be building the the other condos. Sure. Is that to us, or did you That's want to, to you. To jump in. Okay. Go ahead. I'd rather hear it from them. Sure. So the, the condos will be breaking ground as soon as the weather permits. Okay. Um, and those, I believe, will be uh, about a six-month construction time. So um, I guess with regards to the phasing, uh, those would be complete before uh, the second apartment building would be constructed or yeah. completed. If I would have let Sam a answer that question, we'd still be talking. <laughs> so thank you. Remember last meeting? I asked a single question, almost a yes or no, and we sat here for 15 minutes. <laughs> That's all I have. I mean, um, I don't know if I 100% agree with your assessment about that you have to have additional more units in order for it to work. Um, <coughs> You, you were able to rent out the the current facility within months, and um, I just think, really, in reality, it's a better money-making opportunity for you guys at this point, and there's nothing wrong with free enterprise. But um, I understand supply chain stuff and material costs and all that, but we've been dealing we've been dealing with that kind of stuff our whole life, and so. Um, I guess if you hadn't put up a good product from the beginning and the things you have been doing in the city of Menasha, I might have thought a little differently, but you proved yourself, so I appreciate it. Alderman Taylor. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, you know, when I saw the phase two with the eight condos, I liked that project. And why are we reducing down to the six condos? That's not on the agenda, though, tonight. That on there, Mayor. The, this oh, is the about. second apartment building. Okay. I thought there was a reduction on the there six was, but we discussed that and voted on that. Okay. Mayor, right. already approved that uh, a couple months ago. Why are we are we going to be going up in height, uh, another floor, or uh, a wider footprint? Go ahead. Sure. Uh, the the apartment buildings, the second apartment building will be. Um, a, a mirror of what you see as phase one or the the current building there, if that makes sense. So y it won't be much, if anything, different than, than the current building that was constructed. Well, we're going from 30-some to 50-some, correct? Uh, the length or um, the uh, layout of the building has shifted maybe from the pl initial plan that you saw. And again, maybe to Alderman uh, 7X point, it, it is a a true um, kind of reflection of the current market and pricing that that we're seeing right now along with the demand and our ability to lease those up we think very efficiently so okay and then uh, uh, the underground parking is that one unit per unit or is that is there I believe the ratio will be yes a, a little more than one to one similar to uh, the current constructed phase one of our project. Okay. All right. Uh, Sam, do we have to notify any neighbors of, of this? So the current process right now, we're looking at the development agreement. Uh, so before these guys go to, back to the design table to fully compile that plan set to bring it forward, um, that's currently, they're, they're asking for permission to do that. And um, unless this development agreement amendment would get approved, um, that would either consider them from A, uh, doing the building as originally presented or doing that second phase, that second building at all. Um, so with that, this apartment building would require a special use permit, um, similar to the last one. So again, once they kind of get through the, uh, 
Uh, the design phase of that, they would submit for a site plan and special use permit, which does require a, a public hearing. Um, similar to last time, there's not going to be a whole lot of residents that fall within that 100 feet, but we did adopt that policy to put out the sign out on the front of Community Way. Okay, and then I heard some rumblings. I made a mistake on the uh, the condos, the eight condos. Uh, that's part of their project too. Correct. Okay, and what was the change on that? That do we already go through that from from eight to six? Yes, that was a few months ago. This this past oh, fall. Okay, I think. All right, thanks, Sam. Yep. Alderman Sevenak. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, real quickly, Sam, Exhibit C, can you explain um, a little on the estimate? Uh, we have. Yeah, certainly. Um, so the Exhibit C uh, included with the Third Amendment is basically an updated of the estimated payment schedule. So again, uh, they they are looking at ninety for. 95% uh, performance incentive. So basically, once a project comes online, it has a leg year that it, it gets valued at, and then a following year um, where where they actually would pay taxes, and then we would uh, look at that performance payment on we an had annual basis. a different basis. payment schedule before. Yes, in the original agreement, I think it's uh, I could find the page number for you if you wanted. See, so the existing payment schedule was on page 145 of the overall council packet. Um, so basically, because the uh, the overall value of the project would be increasing, right. uh, we're running to the tail end of that development agreement, which is where the uh, pr potential performance incentive payment would come into play, or the the final lump sum of the the last year. Um, if you will note that this project does stand alone, um, so if you see under um, the total revenues, uh, I believe that's about the third column. Uh, over that lifespan, it, it brings in just under four million. Um, so even at you know the roughly twenty percent or that end of the uh, the end of the life, we're at roughly you know three point eight uh, million. So again, we're really close to uh, to hitting that. Um, unfortunately, we just run out of the years um, to to pay that off in the standard format. Okay. Well, I only have one payment schedule. So page 126 of the Common Council packet has the updated payment schedule. I have an, ex I don't know, someone else help me here. I have an Exhibit C, yep. estimated payment schedule. Mm -hmm. Yep, and there's okay. two Exhibit C. So there's staff memo, there's a third amendment to the development agreement, and there's one the memos, Exhibit C. I don't have another printout keep, of keep going, stand payment. Down. All the way down, page 145. I went all the way down. You should have had them together. See, this is the problem I have. But this is the with this. So I can't this put exhibit them side by side and look at them. I got to scroll down 50 pages to find it. <laughs> and you don't. And I'm not even sure which one is the updated and which one is no. See, I don't have oh, keep it. Keep going. Keep going, Stan. Oh, boy, what just happened? You slid over. There you go. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Yeah, keep going. Right there. Right there. There it is. Okay. I might do what James is doing. Have a printout packet. That's fine. You're, you can do that. Because I, I, I can't compare. Now I want to look at them side by side. So now I got to scroll back up 50 pages to look at the side by side. All right, so you, are you on the last one then? But, excuse me. So the, so the, the new exhibit updated C is the last one. No, it's the first one. So that's again, where the, I was. <laughs> exactly. So the memo, the Third Amendment, and then the Exhibit C, the updated Exhibit C is with the Third Amendment. So that's why those two are together. Everything else is past approval as, as, as approved. All right, I'm going to stay on this Exhibit C, and let's go through it again. Certainly. So, uh, so again, you can kind of see uh, tax increment. Um, so that's kind of the annual increment um, that is collected, and then the total revenues, uh, column three. So overall, 
over the life of this project through through those years we're creating um, or they're paying in roughly just under four million so the three point nine seven million dollars the next column over the to the right of that first solid line is a performance incentive so typically again we pay on uh, a portion of the payments so again this development agreement it's 95 percent of that um, so those go through those uh, annual payments and then at the tail end of that um, as you can see we only hit uh, 3.793 uh, million is your normal payment so we are short uh, just under or just over a hundred thousand dollars so again so that for the last year payment to reach the overall 20 percent that last year payment has to be five hundred twenty seven thousand uh, dollars versus the four hundred fifteen but as stated the the three point nine seven million uh, overall the project stands on itself so there's there's still funding available from the existing project so the five percent that we left on the table if at the end of that payment year or the end of that term that project still stands on its own legs and of course this is all I, I do have to throw in this is all estimates based upon the value of the current building the value of the condos and the value of the future uh, building as well so again this certainly could fluctuate um, but we feel strongly that uh, again the project can stand on its own as well as tax increment dis district number 12 is very very healthy so are you saying that you feel that by adding the added units the 18 that it was based on like this payment schedule no not just on that but obviously the all the other things I'd mentioned earlier I like, think I understand your the reason we're upping the unit count is to to essentially make this pro or help this project become financially possible. I realize that but had that so as far as the payment schedule goes what in what how much is the increase then from before I don't I can't do it side by so side it's, uh, the previous uh, would have been capped at about 3.4 okay um, so now we're we're gonna be sitting so five hundred twenty seven thousand uh, dollars again it, it's all dependent on the, on the final project but you're you're pretty close to that 3.9 uh, so again what what they're asking us to do is they want to build a more expensive project yeah. and unless we would remove the max of 3.4 it's not financially feasible for them to do that so again we're just kind of sticking with that 20 percent and that's pretty standard with all of our development agreements that we do approve within the city okay yeah I remember you saying that before okay sorry for my being upset it's just this is starting to get ridiculous this is big stuff you know we're talking you know millions of dollars here and um, we've gone because of COVID we've gone to this system and and trust me I'm probably the most computer savvy up here it's just that this is this is uh, I got my answer at the very end there you know with the five hundred twenty seven thousand dollar difference here so I don't know I just And maybe when are you looking it, when are you I looking may, and Sam can again maybe explain this a bit further but as he mentioned because of the price or size of the project increase it's relative to the tip so the 20% still stays the same it's as it's structured as a pay go tip it's not like we're asking for more money right. to make it work it's still I realize that's a pay go pay go so. tip you're very fortunate that you're in a community that's allowing for this kind of thing because there's a lot, a lot of communities that don't understand TIF or, or my constituency and they feel that you're getting free money so all right would it would anyone else have questions or I think there's we? a couple more here so sure Alderman Rappel uh, thank you mayor this is probably for Sam Sam I'm looking at page 130 and I'm just a little confused um, let me know when you're at 130. Lake Ridge, it, this 
deals with the Lakeshore Ridge Apartments, but then when you look down at letter A, where it says developer wishes to acquire and develop real property located at 600 Lake Park Road and 620 Lake Park Road. Those aren't on that community way where their apartments are. So where is this Lake Park Road 600 and 620? So that's the original development agreement. At the time we executed this, community way did not exist. So those were the lots associated with that project. Okay, but they, they okay, but I mean, these two apartments aren't even on Lake Park Road because community first abuts Lake Park Road. But before community way went in, they would have been addressed to Lake Park Road because it was all private roads at that time. Okay, thank you very much. I was just, thank you. Alderman Langdon. Thank you, Mayor. Okay, sorry, I was, had to finish writing. Um, so, let's see. So you're building a more expensive complex here. The unit's going to be the same price, or are those re units going to be raised in price, and where out there you as developers are seeing that you'll be able to fill them. Sure. So if you're referring to our rental rates, yes. uh, they will be in line with our current or existing phase one of the project. So you could expect a very similar rental rate, um, obviously with uh, kind of market increases as time goes along. Um, and we were able to, to fill up, we're 100% full on phase one, so we do feel there's a, a great demand for this specific type of product, so. Okay, good. Yeah. Um, yeah, that answered, I had three of them, but um, that answered all three. Thank you. Sure. Alderman Grady. Thank you, Mayor. Oops. <clears throat> Thank you, Mayor. At this time, I'd like to recommend to Council approval of the Third Amendment to the Development Agreement between the City of Menasha and Lakeshore Ridge Apartments, LLC, as presented. Is there a second? Second. It's a motion and a second. Do you have any other? Just, oh. Randy, go ahead. So right now, if we approve this, then do the citizens have a chance to voice their opinions and things like that? And far, as far, or is this, once we vote today, is it a good good to go? So as Director Schrader was saying, there will be a public hearing for the special use permit, mm -hmm. but that would, but the development agreement would be approved. Okay. But once you approve the development agreement, it's pretty unlikely you're not gonna approve the special use permit. Understood. Thank you. Okay. So there's a motion and a second. Pardon? Kind of does, yeah. yeah. But so there's, well, they're not going to put in the work, as Director Schrader was saying, unless we're giving them. Did you have another question? I did. Yeah. Do you have a time schedule you're looking at? Uh, we would That's like. What we do tonight, and then we have the public hearing. <laughs> we say, oh, thank you. We, we like your opinion. Maybe I don't understand. What's the question? Well, the thing is, is we're going to, we're, we're going to, oh, I'm sorry, I thought it was on. So, before we have public input, we're going to already approve this, and then when the people come in to f share their opinion, we've already basically made a commitment. So, that's where I have an issue. I want to see this project, trust me. Sure. I, uh, I, maybe I just don't understand the question. That would be well, directed you still to don't? us on that. No. Because no. the public, you recall last time, they were, they, we Absolutely. filled the gallery here. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay, now tonight we're going we're gonna to go ahead and approve this before the public has a say in the mm -hmm. matter? I think to Sam's point, this would be approving the development agreement there's still additional approvals that would include the, the neighbors specifically. Maybe to work on the, the development agreement before it's signed? 
or what? And, and I think what you're looking at is how do we improve this process in the future? Not necessarily with this one, because again, even if it's not 54 because units, because we had one in, in already. In yeah, the past. and even if it's not 54 it's, units, the development agreement has already been approved for 34 units. Again, right. so today what we are talking about is is just that. Um, I understand that, but that's like bait and switch for the for the people that live out there. We thought that you know they were going to come in with 30 plus units, not 50 plus units. Just I'm I'm just trying to make a point here. I, regardless, I'm voting I, but I have to be fair to the people out there that may not be aware of of this issue. Sure. And, um, and and for me personally, I don't think it's an issue because I don't live there. But for them. It's an issue, sure, and uh, that's you know where I'm coming from. I guess I I don't know if this is the right time to say it or you know in the future if this were to be approved. But similar to phase one, we would do and will do everything we can to to appease the neighbors and and create a a second or additional phase that complements phase one. Um, and that's why I'm saying you proved yourself already to me. The, the project you built is probably one of the best ones I've seen in the valley. The valley. Oh, no, I'm not going to postpone. No. I just I want you to be aware of where I am with this and the, and the council, and um, we can move forward. I'm sorry. Alderman Rapella. Thank you, Mayor. Um, uh, my uh, individual who's running against me is running on his dislike and the rest of the people on Cristela's dislike to the apartment complex that you built. Um, so adding this will fuel the fire for the April 5th election to, and I'm going to vote no for it just because my constituents dislike it and um, I need to support their views, so I'm on TV. I am voting no, people on Christella. <laughs> so I can do only one vote. Thank you. So. Alderman Lange. Thank you, Mayor. I just wanted to make, make sure, I'm sure you will, but when we have the public comments that you guys will be here for Absolutely. that also. So Absolutely. the room will be packed and um, there will be hopefully questions and answers and that you'll be involved so that they see hey those developers are here and showing us and this and that so though we hope it's less than the first time we completely understand and, and obviously respect the process so we will be here to answer questions or address concerns yeah. thank you yep seeing no further discussion if we could have a roll call vote please Motion carries 5-2. Thanks for coming tonight, guys. Oh, there's not a tie. There's an odd number of people. Yeah. Item 4 is to a uh, motion to accept and spend the law enforcement special funding grant. Do we have a motion? Alderman Sevenick. Was there a, yeah. there, there is a recommended motion in there? And I, I think it, it just says accept and spend, correct? Yes. Someone else have it? I Go ahead. Thank you. Alderman Schmidt? Um, yes. I will make the motion that we approved to accept and spend the $52,118.85 in funding provided by Governor Evers' investment in safer communities. Second. So motion a second. Is there discussion? Did you have any other discussion, Ann? No? no. Could we have a roll call vote, please? Motion carries 7-0. Item five is the American Rescue Plan Act funding. Is there a motion this evening? Go ahead, go ahead. Because the computer's not working here. And 
Alderman Grady. Thank you, Mayor. I'd like to make a motion to allocate the use of $150,000 of the ARPA funds to facilitate um, citywide grant writing. Is there a second? Second. And is it up to? Okay. So there's a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? Alderman Taylor. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I think for the people at home, Mayor, uh, someone should explain uh, what we're looking at with this with this money and what avenues that we're going out. So we did have a workshop last Wednesday discussing potential uses for ARPA funds, and one of the topics of discussion that evening was that we should look to expand those funds by seeking additional grants that those funds could be used as matching grant matching funds for. So we would look at outsourcing and hiring grant writers in a number of different areas, um, both for capital public works type projects, parks type projects, uh, in general things that would be a capital project that would not add staff or additional um, cost in future years. So that's, that's what we're looking to do with this. We don't have specific people or projects at this point, but there is a significant amount of money out there right now through the ARPA program, especially in the public works area, that we would like to continue working to find additional funds to help the city. Thank you, Mayor. And uh, that workshop was, uh, I think we were all impressed by how many members of the public showed up. So. It's always good to uh, involve the public in decisions of, uh, especially with the ARPA funds. Thank you. Alderman Sevenick. Thank you, Mayor. This was the first thing that uh, our, our group agreed that we should do. And I mean, I, I felt that the 150 was a, a good starting point and it shouldn't obligate us if we need to bring forward if we had to do more because look at the grant writing that we did for Water Street and then we ended up receiving 2.1 million dollars so it's worth it. Alderman Grady. Uh, thank you. Could you also touch on Mayor what it costs to, to write a grant? around? You know, it, it all that. depends on what type of grant you're right. looking at. Some of the more simple grants that Public Works was just working on were in the $3,000 range, but larger grants, I'm not sure, did we get pricing for the idle site, not idle sites, the um, environmental grant? They were significantly more than that. I'm looking at you, Sam. Yeah, so the Water Street quarter, we did have a consultant on board. Um, I know the mayor played a huge role in drafting that. I don't know the exact cost. Um, that one, we did a grant request for both Lawson and Water Street, and because it was a fairly simple grant, he Two did for it. one? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you had the grant that Stantec ended up writing for us for environmental, and I know we got some prices on others that I think were in the 15 plus thousand dollar range if I remember correctly yeah I, I think they, they certainly can range up to, to ten fifteen thousand dollars just depending on the complexity but mm -hmm. your average will probably be three to five so we put a hundred fifty thousand dollars in there that doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to spend it if we can't find good projects to look for No. <laughs> Seeing no further discussion, if we could have a roll call vote, please. Motion carries 7 0. Item J is held over business. Uh, this was tabled a month or two back, so the first item that we would need is to have a motion to remove from the table. If someone wishes to do that, Alderman Sevenick. I'll make a motion to remove from the table the uh, development agreement with uh, Atkins Development Group. Is there a second? Second. So motion is second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Are there any opposed? Seeing none, the motion is 
back on the table and you know, I forgot to look to see if there was a motion so we will just create a new motion this evening if there wasn't one and Mr. Atkins is here this evening if people have questions for him we would be happy to try to get those answered Alderman Sevenick. Okay. Opening statement that might answer a lot of questions for everyone. Sure. As, as most of you know, I've been in negotiation with the city for Talk the better. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Usually my voice is booming enough. <laughs> <laughs> um, we've been in negotiation with the city for the better part of a year um, regarding our um, um, Whittle Lake Cottages development. As many of you know, there was an original 19 lots, okay, that had already been platted and approved that we've been building on and actually are doing very well with. Okay, this is regarding the undeveloped land to the south, south of the property. Okay, um, so anyway, we worked through all the various issues with the city, and then there were some um, kind of ulterior issues in particular with the Corps of Engineers. Um, what this centered on was the extension of Kelly Lake Drive. It was very important to the city that Kelly Lake Drive be able to be extended as a second means of access to the development, and I respect that. Um, from my point of view, I was all for Kelly Lake Drive, provided I could put homes on the street. You know, as you might understand, I didn't want to pay for a street that I couldn't put homes on. So the sticking point was, um, was interpretation of wetlands. Um, under the Trump administration, there was a very liberal interpretation of wet, wetlands. And uh, with the onset of the Biden administration, the um, interpretation of wetlands had become much more restrictive. And there was a period of time where this was just in limbo. Um, so um, approximately two weeks ago, and correct me if I'm wrong, Mayor, uh, we agreed to um, split the cost of the street if for some reason you know, the core wasn't able to rule favorably on this. Now, subsequently, within the last week, we've received communication from the core that they're going to go back to their original interpretation, okay, and that was precipitated by a letter the core had um, uh, uh, given to McMahon uh, civil engineers approximately two years ago that uh, they they ruled they had no jurisdiction two years ago so the communication we received a week ago is the core will stand behind that original interpretation saying that they have no jurisdiction so we have that verbally we don't have it in writing yet okay so the development agreement as it stands right now is that you know if for some reason this doesn't come through we'll split the cost of the street but we fully expect within the next month we will have the approval that we can put homes on the street and then it becomes a non-issue so um, I, I think it's addressed whatever the eventuality is but the strong um, feeling is that within the next month this will be taken care of from our point of view, we need to move forward with this quickly. Uh, we're losing valuable construction season. You're probably all seeing in the headlines what's happening with interest rates. And then in particular, um, unless I have the next 80, 89 lots, I can't justify building a clubhouse in the pool. Okay, I want to get the clubhouse in the pool going for this building season. So thus the urgency to address this tonight and then I also wanted to address um, the um, commentary that I heard from one of the residents lately or, or earlier tonight, okay, on the issue of docks on the pond. We're not necessarily insistent on docks on the pond. In fact, it's a relatively minor issue. But we have kind of an awkward type situation now where if we go through with the purchase of the land in the pond, we will own a pond where there's approximately 12 people in Randy Rapella's district that already have docks on the pond, okay? And uh, so they're going to have docks on the pond that they don't own, and I'm going to tell people that own the pond that they can't have docks. So that's kind of an awkward situation, and uh, it, it would probably be tough to deal with. So I, I would ask to just at least table that I I particular issue 
or just remove it from the development agreement for at this time until we can adopt language that can address both issues, both us putting in, in docks, like which I said, we're not particularly emotional about, but I guarantee you the people that already have docks will be very emotional about it. Um, with that, I'll shut up and give everyone a chance to ask questions. Alderman Sarek, did you have a question? Yes, I have several, actually. You might as well stay up there. <laughs> no, you, stay up there. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, yes, sir. <laughs> okay, thank you. So um, there's uh, quite a bit of language in here that changes particular dates to the wording as soon as reasonably practical. I don't find, I don't like that. Uh, you, we need to have um, con concise timelines for this development. Uh, you'd kind of address the uh, secondary access area. Mm -hmm. I mean, I wonder if we shouldn't table that then because um, why would we agree to 50-50 if you're able to work something out with the core? I think you have to have, you have to have a secondary access, and I don't think it should necessarily be paid for by the city. Okay, highly likely that's going to be the situation. The core approval is imminent, but the agreement we had worked out several weeks ago, if for some reason I had to bear the expense of a, a pretty significant street yeah. without being able to put houses on it, but let, yet the city would realize the taxes for my development for infinity, okay, that was the agreement and the yeah. thought process between what, what, what we agreed to. Yeah, uh, I don't buy those lines anymore. Uh, I think it's important uh, for for all several reasons to have that. Um, we don't, if we don't have that secondary access, um, you're gonna be sending the people that would develop in your area running down the streets of the neighborhoods that were up here that weren't happy about the development in the first place. And we have to have that. And it's in this agreement now, and if I approve this tonight, then I'm saying that um, that basically the burden becomes the city's and, and, and that uh, in addition to share the cost, 50-50 has not been uh, our standard practice. So also too, you don't have a completion date. I believe we had a completion date in the past and again, back to the clubhouse that you addressed, the clubhouse in the original agreement should be uh, finished on 1231 of 23, which is a couple of years from now. Do you feel you can't make that date? Um, actually, we do feel we can make that date. So then that should stay in there. No, we're not, we weren't suggesting that we wanted the clubhouse to go away, but what we were suggesting, if we're not able to get these extra 89 lots, yeah. we wouldn't be able to, to pursue the clubhouse. Well, in the original agreement, uh, it does say 1231-23, and um, it would appear that you're pushing that date out beyond 1231-23. What, uh, pardon me for asking, I, I should have this in front of me, but what date is it saying that we will have the clubhouse done by? I believe, 12, well, Sam could answer that. I believe it's 12 31 23. I, I think uh, the attorney modified it to before the, uh, the final street was to be put in. Um, so on or before the final street, which would have been the five years. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I'm willing to agree to the the date that uh, uh, 123123 does that work okay um, Mary writing that down I just wrote it down thank you <laughs> and then um, obviously uh, more people are bent out of shape about the pond thing I'm not 
I'm not. I think uh, that's why people move to these things. They like, they like water, and even if it's a pond, fine. And I don't have a problem, this is my opinion, with people if they want to put docks out there. But then um, we don't want situations where all of a sudden the docks turn into these junky things that, uh, I, I mean, I think we'd have to inspect them or something. With the, they, which, you it know what be. I'm saying? Because they freeze over and maybe they have to have a type that's portable that pulls in or something like that. But Well, it would be my preference, okay, yeah. at least for the residents that, you know, I'm going to create homes for, is that we probably have a shared dock that you know, you know everyone can use okay. rather than have uh, rather than have eight individual docks. Okay. But like I said, the more sensitive thing that, to deal with is because initially the HOA is going to own the pond, okay, and we're going to be having to have discussions with Randy's constituents telling them to take their uh, docks out of the pond. I just assume not have to have that conversation. Okay. And, you know, as far as the fountains and things, I don't know why the city is, gets bent out of shape on that or something. I like that. In fact, it, if the water starts to, you know, get green in that, the, it aerates it and it mm -hmm. kind of keeps it a little cleaner. Um, but uh, I don't know what, do, do we have regulations in place for ponds and stuff the, and the maybe that's something with the we, fountains is that you reduce your stormwater credits when they have fountains in them i see so that's did it, you hear what the mayor said i, I don't hear what yeah, oh, yeah it, that's what i thought it reduces the stormwater credit when you have a fountain in it is the reason why they want to make sure and well, i'm not sure where you guys are located or you must be there if you want to explain that a little bit further Thank you. Uh, yes, so uh, just a couple of things if I could. Um, I do have a relatively extensive stormwater background and I've reviewed a lot of model plan models. Um, the, it's a zone of influence thing, so whatever the zone is of the fountain that actually that area has to be accounted for in your modeling and it is actually a water treatment reduction. So we actually about a year ago have a TMDL that was implemented for Lake Winnebago so we have to optimize how much treatment we get in those areas uh, on the east side of the city. So um, reducing that doesn't help us with our citywide modeling as well, especially if at some point in time we do take these over. So that's, it can be, they can be added, but just it's gonna reduce your treatment. So, you know, we would just need to see the modeling updated for that. Can I ask you why we would wanna take them over? Especially after they've been being used for several years and then all of a sudden they become the new toxic sites that have to be cleaned. I've been saying this for, mm -hmm. what, James, 30 years or so. Right, and we've, we've waffled ourselves on that, especially with docks being there. Uh, it sets a precedence. This is a stormwater treatment pond. This is not a recreational pond. Yeah. Um, and I think that that's one thing that, just to keep in mind as we move forward with this, with the docks in particular, if we were to be taking this over, we would wanna see permitting um, from our perspective for these docks if they have to be removed for dredging maintenance that sort of a thing uh, That were covered to be able to have those removed um, One reason we would want to take these over for treatment is to meet that citywide TMDL that we do have to work towards with the DNR What what what's the big deal if there's a fountain what changes the the ponds Importance whether the water goes shooting up in the air or not What's the big it stirs deal? the it stirs the water up. So the way water to get water quality in a wet pond, that water flows in from a rain event off of yeah. the impervious surfaces, it has to be able to settle in that okay. water to the bottom, and that's that's why we have to dredge that those sediments all go to the bottom. Um, stirring that water up reduces that settling. That what if occur. they own the pond? Would they have to dredge it? Would they have to yes um, yep. maintain it? I mean, those are yes. issues you guys have to think about so I don't personally if if I were to buy a lot out there I would like to be able to have a dock I would like to see a fountain and uh, but let's see do I 
Can I add just one thing with that? And so staff has been fairly vocal about that aspect um, since this development agreement has come forward. And one of the things I guess we're stating is not, at least myself, maybe less uh, behind me, but is not that we would forcefully say no, not at all. Um, but the language currently as written states shall be placed into uh, the stormwater management plan. There's nothing currently in the stormwater management plan, and that's number? not the appropriate document to to place something like that. So what we were having discussions with is written consent. So in a uh, mutual agreement, okay, this size of fountain, you pay for utilities, uh, maintenance. Um, that's what staff was looking for. Do you have a, a what number is that? Four point something? What is it? 7.2. Okay. It says Atkins agrees that the ponds are designed as regional stormwater detention facilities and shall not be used inconsistent with the stormwater management plan. Docks and fountains shall be permitted so long as they are not prohibited by the stormwater management plan. So that kind of rules that out. Right. Uh, the cost of maintenance of the repair of any fountain shall be the responsibility of HOA and there shall be no use of motorized, not motorized, because uh, Alderman Langdon asked me, but I think someone could take a kayak or a, or a rowboat or something out there. Is that, would that would be allowable? <laughs> <laughs> or other similar apparatus, which is vague again, and no treatment of the shoreline beyond the original approved within the stormwater management plan. So hopefully you guys caught that because there's that sounds I've done one review. very wordy. We've gotten one iterance uh, uh, draft, I guess you could say, one draft so far of the stormwater management plan. It is not written in there at all. Um, we do have a lot of revisions we do need to be making um, as we work through the site plan review process. So take yeah. that for what it is. But yeah, see, you guys ask us to approve these things, and then you tell us, well, we're going to, we have these things, and then it changes. And then, and then I say, whoa, I even read it on the council floor, and that's not what was in there. The other thing about this is, is the, the docks and fountains and things of that nature, it's, it's not necessarily, again, that we're potentially against all of that. We do have some ponds that have fountains in them and things of that nature. Um, it, it comes down to who's going to maintain it. Um, what is the expectation then of us with that? If, if you turn this into a pond, it's, it's a stormwater detention pond. Okay, don't, don't try to confuse that with an aesthetic pond that you dug in your back 40 and you go swimming and things of that nature. That, that's not what this is, okay? So there, you're going to set an expectation of what this pond is supposed to be. So by allowing all of this, now everyone around this pond is going to have an expectation. And we, we and all of us have not had that conversation to that extent yet to go the direction that you would like. And I don't fishing? think this, what's that? How about fishing? Am I going to go out there and stop the, the young kids no, that are I out mean, fishing can, on can some of these ponds? No, I don't. No. But, but again, if, you, if you're not? going to take your dog out there and you're going to throw, your, throw the ball in this pond for your dog, yeah. and then you come back to us and say, my dog got sick because they were in this pond, mm -hmm. you know, this, this pond is, it's meant to take the pollutants out of the water. You know, there's advisories on Lake Winnebago for blue-green algae and things of that nature. This pond is taking those nutrients out of the stormwater that would eventually end up into Lake Winnebago. That's why I call them future toxic sites, that we'll all be spending millions of dollars of cleaning. And I think it, I just, I'd, you've heard me say this before, but I disagree with the DNR on, on the stormwater retention stuff. Uh, I see it's good in some areas, but I just see it. All they're doing is pushing stuff somewhere else so that the people with the bucks, meaning those in government and that, are going to have to clean it up. And, you know, 
uh, sorry for wasting your time here. So, uh, so um, how about these uh, the the wording in here as the areas as as soon as reasonably applicable? That's usually not something that's typical in a development agreement. Do you have an agreeable date, Mr. Atkins? I mean, we've talked with your attorney about Alderman, that. Alderman uh, Seven Inch, did I say that correctly? Seven Nick, but okay. that's fine. Um, I agree with your opinions, okay? But I also understand and respect where the city's coming from is the how to administer this. Um, in my scheme of things, okay, I'm not that emotional about it. Okay, I would like to have a fountain. I would like to have a dock. Do I have to? No. It's much more important to me to be able to move forward with this development. Right, obviously. Okay, and I agree with staff that, you know, this is, should be sat down, talked about, and come to some kind of, you know, common consensus as to how this would be administered. Actually, what he was asking about was the date, I think it's to acquire the property, and there's a couple other ones in there that just say as soon as practical. I mean, is there a date that we could insert in there? The end of this year? I don't know what date might work for you. Um, I think it's... Sam, do you have a section on that? It's um, all right in getting the necessary approval. That one I think is done. The, the final plat, do you have... And is there the purchase of the property too? Yeah, and purchase of the property. So can we insert a date in there that you would be happy with three or four months out from now? Um, let's say Labor Day. Okay. So August 31st. I'm good with that. Yeah. And I think your question on the second access stand, the way it's mm -hmm. written. Yeah, it's really. Is if. Well, the you Army, sort of had an answer. Well, if the Army Corps does not give approval for the street that you're planning on putting in there, then we would look at how many lots you could get in there with the street, and we would look at splitting whatever cost for the areas that don't have lots abutting it. So that's that wording only happens if right, but uh, there's no there's one percent there that mm -hmm. <laughs> you might say ninety nine. I'm not sure. And, if it's and you 99. think the value of this is fifty? Did you say forty or fifty million? Okay, so actually, if we can have you stand by the microphone. Yeah, you have to go to the mic because this is televised. Okay, so. Otherwise, you look like a mime when you're on TV and no one can tell what you're saying. Okay. Um, it's been a long time since we presented here. Okay. We originally thought there would be plus or minus 100 lots. Uh, after everything, all the hoops were jumped through and everything, I, it appears as well we're going to end up with 89 lots. Okay, but the, the big significant change, our average sale so far has been 600,000. So just round off for simple, for simple numbers, uh, that's $54 million of valuation. And, you know, I don't, want, I don't think we want to split hairs, no. you know, on moving forward with what's going to create a tremendous amount of valuation for the city. And we're not receiving $1 of TIF money. Right. Right. So that's why I was okay with putting this in there because we're not giving them a TIF. There it's are other too open-ended. You know, and I have to have mentioned that. Um, Alderman Nichols called me with the same concerns I had. So she shared exactly where I was with these. So I'm just trying to button it up, clean it up, and I think we can move forward. I don't, do we need to offer those as amendments? We can and do the amendments. Mayor or uh, Alderman Sevenick. Yeah. <laughs> may, I, may I just add, I was addressing both. Um, that I, it, it sounds the like The thing so, is, I can I, turn your mic off. I, <laughs> It, looking at the language, the parties acknowledge with respect to the need for the modification as a result of the decision of the Army Corps, if Kelly Lake is determined as a secondary access, each party can expect 
a share of 50-50 financial responsibility. I, are, are you guys trying to get out of that? And I, I apologize, I was not uh, involved in that discussion. If no homes can be constructed on Kelly Lake, then it's 50-50? Yes. Does that minor amendment make sense then to that point to, to state if Kelly Lake is a secondary access with no development abutting, then at that point it's 50-50? Because I, I think that's what both of the parties, uh, being the mayor and uh, Mr. Atkins, are, are stating there. I, I just, yeah, I would agree with uh, Alderman Sevenick that I don't think it's worded in that fashion. And that's what you were looking for, Mr. Atkins, correct? Only if there were no houses built there would we. I remembered to go back here this time. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> um, let me think this out for a second. Um, what the Corps of Engineers, it was kind of an all or nothing proposition. Okay, um, we went from a very liberal interpretation of wetland to a very restrictive. And to the point where um, a month ago it was going to cost me almost $700,000 in wetland remediation, which would have killed the project. Okay, that's how extreme it got at one point. But uh, it looks like, you know, level heads ultimately prevailed. And luckily, McMahon found this letter from several years ago indicating that the, um, the Corps of Engineers uh, waived jurisdiction. So that was what saved us, actually. So... The Corps of Engineers said they're going to make good on their letter. They just haven't done it in writing yet. They promised, as of last Thursday, they promised us something in writing within a month. And then the whole Kelly Lake Drive issue becomes a non-issue. And I, I may not be exactly correct, but I believe as far as lots that would be um, actually part of the new Kelly Lake Drive, uh, there's eight lots, and it's not as many as I would have hoped for. Okay, but it's good enough. So do do we just want to insert that if there's no no development abutting Kelly Lake Road? I should talk closer to the microphone apparently. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> so Alderman Sevenick is suggesting, I think actually Director Schrader is suggesting that we insert if Welcome there's us. no development abutting Kelly Lake Road, then we would split those costs. That is correct. Okay, so we could amend the language in there to state that. Right. Okay. Well, we need to make a motion first and sure. then add the amendments. So I'll... Uh, Dan, do you agree with what we're, we're saying? <laughs> just want to see if there's... There's no recommended motion, is there? No, so, but it was just... Uh, we'll, uh, at this time, then, Mayor, I'll, I'll make a motion that uh, we go along with the development agreement but by and between the City of Menasha and Atkins Development Group, LLC, the Lakeland Lake Cottages are... Okay. So is there a second, and then you're going to make some amendments, make correct? The amendment. So there's a motion and a second by which party? Ted. Ted. Okay. And then the first amendment would deal with if there is no development with on the Kelly properties that we split 50-50, something to that. So effect. we would insert uh, with no development abutting Kelly Lake Road. We would do that. Do you want you to have put that? them all together? Yes. Okay. So she's got it. Okay, okay. So here's here's the three four amendments that I'm seeing. Can you pull up that the latest map? That the the three areas where it states as soon as reasonably practical. Yep. We put a date of August 31st of 2022 in there. I'm agreeable to that. And the second is right below that in 1.2 that talks about. If no development is abutting Kelly Lake Road, each party can expect to share that financial responsibility. Mayor? Yes? And just for clarification, so that's Kelly Lake Road south of the pond. Sure. So That is correct. You have that, Kay Kaylee? Yes. Okay. Um, the clubhouse be completed by 1231 of 23. Is that still agreeable? 
the clubhouse. Yes. Okay. okay. And that we would have written consent for docks and fountains with the city. Okay. Can you, uh, Haley, you're typing all this. If you want to put that up then when you have time. <laughs> sure. Thank okay. you. And I would, I would add, you know, with the docks and fountains, again, that they would not be unreasonably withheld or something to that nature. I think that's basically what the, uh, uh, the Atkins group is looking at. Okay. Is there a second on the amendments? Okay. Okay, but there's seven lots, 201 through 207. Okay. Those are the ones that are in question. Okay. This lot would stay regardless because we have access over here. Sure. But these it's 201 the areas through 207 is what's where in question. Where it says as okay. reasonably practical. Okay, show those guys. That then. was last time, though, too. Yeah, I think I recall that. Yeah. So we have a, so Haley, a motion to amend. I'm working on it. Okay, so let her finish, Mayor, okay. and then she can post it up there. Um, yeah, we have the motions, I suppose, if they want to discuss. But I need a second on the amendments first. Is there anyone who wishes well, to second the amendments? I was hoping to reread them up on. Okay. We, yeah, there they so go. We, okay. Not completed. Um, as soon as reasonably practical, should be replaced by August 31st. And then the cost will be split 50 50. To other end. Oh. Um, that's not right. The project will not be completed by. <laughs> well, so the, where it says as reasonably practical. Darn it, I thought we could sneak that in there. No. <laughs> That'd be quite a trick. <laughs> I don't know. Tonight there's a show, 100 Days or something, where they build a house and, on HGTV. It used to be, even as recently as five years ago, you could even get a moderately sized home built in three to four months. It's impossible now. Sure. Uh, supply chain and labor being what it is. Yep. Uh, now you're looking at six to eight months. I used to be able to count on uh, as soon as one subcontractor walked out, the other was walking in. Not anymore. Well, where where are they? They're just not coming in. Subcontractors, why don't they one needs the other one comes in with so much what's work. in between? Nothing here. Um, the problem is, is just there's just not enough labor out there. Right. Not even close. Oh, okay. And it's not just us, it's every industry. Yep. Yeah, yeah, so okay. That's, that's what it is. Got her, Mayor. I think we got this much closer. We'll see if it looks right. <laughs> okay. 
So the amendments were as reasonably practical replaced by 831.22. So that's the areas of purchasing the property and those sorts of things. And um, if no development abutting the road, then we would split the cost of the road. Clubhouse completed by 2033 and written consent for docks and fountains. Does that look better? Does that look better to it's you? It's 23, Mayor, not 33. Was that? It's 23. There you go. Boy, he oh. still doesn't want that clubhouse built. <laughs> I missed that. Sorry. Does that look? I know. I was just teasing the mayor. The, the sign is up, right? I subscribed to your Facebook page, so I've been seeing your little posts. Mm -hmm. so, so was there a second? There was not yet. Is there a second? Okay. So there's a motion and a second by... Tom Grady for the amendments. Do we have discussion on the amendments? Did you guys want to discuss the amendments, Randy? No, I just wanted to know about that one road. Oh, hold on. Story. Go ahead. Uh, my road, uh, Mr. My road. Ad, yeah, my, Mr. <laughs> Atkins, um, that road that comes off of Kernan Avenue is Kelly Lake Drive, okay? And then that road that actually, I think you guys use it for your, for your trucks and things, that access road. Is that going to be a permanent road? For no, no. That the, will not be a permanent road. The, the, there, there's actually verbiage that the DOT indicated when it quits being a farm road, okay. uh, we're required to remove it. Okay, so the second access or uh, escape road, I'll use that. The two roads are Gosling Way, which is to the north side of that big pond, or to the south side, Kelly Lake Drive, and they both go on to Kernan Avenue. Is that the two You're ways? You're still going to come in through Kernan, but you can spread out to the subdivision from two different tickets. Correct, points. yes. And that, that, that's it. That'll be, that, that's yeah. good. I want and then, to, of course, they can come in from the north on Kernan. They could, yes. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Thank you very much, sir. Okay, you're welcome. Ted? <laughs> well, Pam's not here, but... James is. <laughs> so with, with all, I don't know how up to speed you are with this whole process, but um, I'm glad Alderman Sevenick got dates putting in instead of some of the verbiage. So I'm just looking for your, I don't know if it's blessing or you're comfortable with how this is written up here. Am I on? There, now you're on. Um, I'm not sure I'm in a position to, to give an opinion about this. This is the first I've seen this right I here. Understand. Um, yep. And I have not been part of the process. But what, what I understand the, the amendments are intended to be is, is to give direction to staff to, to change aspects of the already existing agreement with this specific language in there. And if, as long as the council has the understanding of what that is, it would be, it would be acceptable. Okay, thanks, James. I can't make advances like that all the time. <laughs> <laughs> We'll make sure we hire you in June, okay? <laughs> so right now what's on the floor is just the amendments. Are there any more, is there any more discussion on the amendments? So seeing none, if we could have a roll call vote on just the amendments. Motion carries 7-0. Okay, and then. Thank now, you very much. Oh, hold on, we got one more vote. Okay. Now it has to be as amended. <laughs> so is there any other discussion on the agreement in general? No? Okay, so this is as amended then what we just changed. Perfect. She just added as amended. Pardon? Motion carries 7-0. Okay, now you're good to go. We will Thank you. We will make these modifications, and then we'll get it set ready for signature for you in the next couple of days. Okay. Okay, thank you, Steve. Thank you. Thank you, gen ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Thanks. We'll see you in 2033. Thank you, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we have ordinances and resolutions, R2. R2 do we have a motion? Yes, thank you, Mayor. 
I'd like to make the motion to accept to make the um, resolution for R-2-22. It's a resolution authorizing the application for road project grant funding no. from the Wisconsin Department of Transportation introduced by myself, Alderman Langdon. So there's, there's a motion and a second by Alderman Taylor. Any discussion? Seeing none, if we could have a roll call vote, please. Motion carries 7 0. Hopefully, the first of our successful grants, right? Mm -hmm. Item two is resolution five. Do you, is there a motion or? Oh, doesn't matter. Yeah. All right. I'll make the motion to approve R-522, a resolution to approve the cancellation of outstanding checks and the write-off of the general uncollectible accounts receivable and delinquent personal property tax receivables introduced by Mayor Mercus. Is there a second? I'll second it. It's a motion a second. Discussion? Alderman Taylor. Thank you, Mayor. Um, a member from the public had mentioned uh, the Boatway property, and I think it's $20,000. Uh, could someone highlight that for us? Do you want me to do that, Jen, or do you want to? Maybe Jen. So, apparently he would like you to. <laughs> I'll fill in if you need more. <laughs> okay, so this was, uh, um, we had invoiced this property owner, I believe back in 2015, um, to connect to the sanitary system. Um, and then this one is... It's my understanding no longer collectible, um, and so, the expense was. I yeah. mean, it was paid out of the debt service fund. Therefore, it has to be written off to the, the debt service fund as well. So around two thousand, we put in the backbone system for sewer and water out to the Lake Park Villas area, and as properties annexed, as properties wanted to connect, the agreement was they had to annex into the city. This property refused to annex and Waverly allowed them to connect. So we did bill them for their area-wide special assessment, but because they are not within the city of Menasha, they never annexed, we do not have statutory authority to place it on the property tax bills, and Harrison also will not place it on the property tax bill. So this property as well as, I don't know, probably 50 or 60 more acres, we will never collect that area-wide special assessment because of the incorporation of Harrison. Okay. Thank you. Stan? I say we take it off and we continue to, to bill them yeah. and keep collecting interest. I agree. What was that? I think we should not put it on here and that we should continue to uh, bill him and add interest. Well, it would have, it's passed its collection period. Um, so from an audit point of view, um, we, we have to write it off at this point. And we did bill him, I don't know how many times, and he just refused to pay it. Right, since because we don't have and, then we, and then we enter into agreements to allow for him to rent our property? I was not in favor of that agreement. And that agreement will be terminated this year with this a year. grant. Yeah. So. Well, it's really unfortunate, too, because it really went against our boundary agreement, too, mm -hmm. well, and everything else, and it's, it's, it's dirty. It's dirty. Seeing no further discussion, if we could have a roll call vote. Uh-oh. You want to, can you clear it and hit it again? Oh. So we're going to vote on that again. Hopefully it ends. Okay. So this, this is also R5. Yeah. Motion carries 7-0. What was the question, James? 
set a question for Jen. Why couldn't we collect from Anytime Fitness? Uh, certainly, they're still in business throughout the Fox cities. Must have a franchise. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, we'd be collecting from that specific location um, for that personal property. Um, but keep in mind that all of them, except for one of the accounts, we are just writing off the city portion. On an annual basis, we are able to charge back the other taxing entities for their portion of these um, that have either gone out of business, bankrupt, or you know, a couple of criteria. And then when it gets to be that seven-year mark, then we would write off the city portion um, if there are any of those accounts. All right, thank you. Okay, item three is resolution six. Do we have a motion? Sure, item three is resolution six. It's a resolution to apply and spend uh, WEDC idle sites grant. Alderman seven. Move for R622. Is there a second? It's a motion and a second by Tom Grady. Any discussion? Seeing none, if we could have a roll call vote, please. Motion carries seven zero. Item L is appointments. There is one for the Landmarks Commission. Alderman Grady. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I would like the council to accept the um, application or, or the mayor's appointment of Sarah Bauer, but I don't have the dates on here. Oh, it's, it's, yeah. it's on the oh, next 3 21 22 through 3 1 24. Is there a second? Second. I was too busy looking at my laptop. <laughs> There's a motion and a second. Um, Alderman Taylor. Mayor, uh, there was a question from the public. Uh, is there a list that uh, an existing list, and then you take off the top of that list, or how there does is, that go? There is not a specific list. I don't. Mayor, I can't there is not a specific list. I do not have any applicants right now for the Landmarks Commission other than this person, and this person is actually the spouse of a former Landmarks um, Commissioner who has asked to not be reappointed, and his spouse is going to be re be appointed for that space instead. So, so spouses trump. There is no one else that has asked. Yeah, but just she's qualified. Someone called me and said, "Do you do you approve of two spouses being on the same commission?" I said, "Well, the other one is leaving the commission, so otherwise, no, I would not appoint a husband and a wife to that the was same tongue in cheek here. or two brothers." <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I didn't have that opportunity. <laughs> All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Are there any opposed? Seeing none, the motion carries. Item N is public comment. Got two people left. No? Is there a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Second. We are adjourned. Thank you. The University of Wisconsin Oshkosh Fox Cities Campus assists the City of Menasha with video recordings of city meetings. Menasha residents and interested parties can get information about city meetings, meeting agendas, and other documents from the city website, www.cityofmenasha-wi.gov. To express opinions about City of Menasha issues or these broadcasts, contact the Mayor's office, 920-967-3608. Contact the city alderman. Contact information appears on the website. Or complete the electronic feedback form on the city website. All public portions of the meetings are recorded in entirety and are not edited.